enzyme deficiencies, we have two important enzymes, G6PD and pyruvate kinase. So they are important in the metabolism going on uh, within the RBCs. Proxismal nocturnal hemoglobin urea, this is a very important acquired condition. Now, this membrane defect or hemoglobin defect or enzyme defect, they are the inherited conditions. But this is the only hemolytic anemia uh, uh, due to the acquired membrane defect, not the intrinsic membrane defect. You know, uh, there are certain proteins called anchoring proteins in the cell membrane of the RBCs which protect RBCs from damage by the complement system. Complements are the proteins which tend to destroy the RBCs. So when these anchoring proteins are deficient, there will be excessive hemolysis of the RBCs. So here, this is an example of spherocytosis. You, these are the spherocytes, they are small, more spheroidal. This heredity elliptocytosis, which is very rare, and you can see the elliptical cells. Now in the sickle cell, I told you this abnormal hemoglobin is formed, hemoglobin S, which ultimately results in uh, deformity in the shape of the RBCs. They become like sickle-like, any like Duranti in Urdu we call it. So uh, this, uh, this is a typical sickle cell. Sometimes you have target cells also. And sometimes these sickle cells are in fact the boat-shaped cells. In G6PD deficiency, you know, this, this enzyme indirectly protects RBCs from lysis by the oxidizing agents. So when the uh, oxidizing agents are unprotected, they attack the RBCs and uh, actually the macrophages will attack. Because what happens is that the, by oxidizing agents, the globin chains get denatured and they precipitate within the RBCs and when they go into the spleen, the macrophages, they consider it as some foreign elements and start biting them practically. So this is a bite cell. So this is because of the fact that these denatured globins within the RBCs, they are being uh, phagocytosed by the RBCs. This is a typical picture of beta thalassemia major. I told you this is an inherited condition, which is because of the quantitative de deficiency of either the uh, beta chains or the alpha chains of the hemoglobin. So they, they may be hypochromia, they may be macrocytosis, and then they are target cells. You may have immature forms, that is a nucleated RBCs. So all sorts of morphology you can see in beta thalassemia major, which is uh, an important inherited uh, form of hemolytic anemia. Now, again, talking about increased def uh, destruction, so far we have talked about intrinsic defect. Now the extrinsic defect, it means that inserted from outside of the body. For example, the most important being antibody mediated or immune mediated. It's a prototype of um, uh, antibody destruction called autoimmune hemolytic anemia, which is typically seen in a condition known as, it's an autoimmune disorder, SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus. Sometimes drugs can lead to antibody formation. Alloimmune means that uh, these are not within the uh, body, uh, antibodies being formed, but from the outside. Uh, the mismatched blood transfusion. For example, uh, a person with uh, blood group A is being transferred with blood group B. So he will have already formed anti-A antibodies which will destroy the A blood cells. Mechanical destruction, prosthetic valves. There are certain situations where you have to replace the heart valves, like for example the mitral valve, in a condition known as mitral stenosis. So that valve between the left atrium and the left ventricle, so that artificial valve over the period of months, two years, the, the blood passing through that valve will be mechanically destroyed because of the uh, turbulence by this prosthetic valves. Now, microangiopathic hemolytic anemias is a large group of uh, uh, disorders where the smaller blood vessels, there is deposition of microthrombi or the fibrin uh, deposits. Like in a condition like uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation and thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. This, uh, of course, will be dealt in your higher classes. 
Now, what happens in microcirculation when the RBCs are passing through these uh, smaller blood vessels? They are mechanically obstructed and destroyed by either microthrombi or the fibrin strands, resulting in uh, a destruction of the RBCs. Severe burns, you know, they will be uh, the, uh, if there is excessive heat over the skin, the underlying blood vessels, when the blood is circulating, they will be destroyed or damaged by excessive heat. Infections like malaria, the uh, malaria parasite can cause intravascular hemolysis or even extravascular hemolysis within the Spleen, arterial aneurysm. Sometimes, you know, this aneurysm is a dilatation of some part, small part of the blood vessel. Here, this may be turbulence of blood, and they may cause uh, hemolysis. Now, this is the thermal injury, where the excessive heat uh, damages the RBCs like this. You know, there are small craniations you can see in the membrane. This one, so they will appear like this, and then they will be destroyed in the spleen. This is the uh, microangiopathy in disseminated intravascular coagulation. You can see uh, helmet shaped like cells, bur cells, mishappen cells, triangular cells, all sorts of uh, cells you will see. This is another picture, this is like for example helmet shaped cell. Now, there are certain miscellaneous mechanisms, you can divide them in, uh, like this as well. We have already discussed anemia of chronic disease, underlying mechanism, chronic infections, inflammation, malignancy, autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid arthritis. Already mentioned that erythropoietin is decreased and its unresponsiveness, the marrow cells are unresponsiveness to the erythropoietin. And then very important is that there is a failure of uh, mobilization of RN from the macrophages to the developing erythroid precursors. So RN is not uh, available for hemoglobin synthesis. Myelodysplastic syndrome. This is an acquired bone marrow disorder where there are dysplastic changes within the developing bone marrow cells. So they are abnormal and they are destroyed earlier um, within the bone marrow causing anemia. Bone marrow infiltration, this is a large group, leukemia cells, lymphoma cells, multiple myeloma cells or plasma cells, secondary to bone marrow. It means that there is malignancy, primary malignancy elsewhere, for example, prostatic carcinoma, lung carcinoma, breast uh, carcinoma or the malignancies, they all can spread to the bone marrow. Lead poisoning, lead in excessive quantity can inhibit heme synthesis and also results in globin uh, destruction and resulting in uh, hypochromia and hemolytic anemia. Vessels disease is inherited condition autosomal recessive where there is uh, defect in copper metabolism and excessive amount of copper uh, uh, results in oxidative damage to the globin chains of the uh, hemoglobin uh, resulting in usually intravascular hemolysis. So this is a, a slide of an acute leukemia, acute myeloid leukemia. So there are blast cells, they appear like this. These are immature cells and they are primitive cells and they, you will see the DNA is primitive and there are some nucleoli present in them. Now very important aspect of anemia is the clinical correlation or manifestations. What is the underlying pathophysiology? that results in uh, the symptomatology of anemia. Now, uh, the manifestations of anemia are correlated with the following factors. The most important being tissue hypoxia or as a result of the decreased oxygen carrying capacity of blood. And this we will explain in the next slide. The extent of change in the whole blood volume, how quickly the, you, uh, the per person loses blood. If there is massive hemorrhage, uh, there will be acute blood loss and the patient will present with fainting, syncope, hypotension, shock-like condition. But if the blood loss is gradual, like chronic blood loss, anemias, gradual blood loss, then over the period of months or years, there will be a de uh, development of iron deficiency. Ability of cardiopulmonary compensation. Now here in this case, uh, there will be 
cardiac symptoms and pulmonary symptoms and depends how well the compensatory mechanisms operate in the body and this will again we'll discuss in the next slide manifestation of the underlying illness for example if there is leukemia or multiple myeloma or some chronic infections they have their own manifestations which mask the uh, manifestations of anemia now tissue hypoxia is the most important clinical uh, the pathophysiology resulting in uh, like for example fatigue uh, now fatigue easy fatigability or tiredness muscular aches and pains are very typical seen in, uh, seen in anemias why because the ma uh, the uh, muscle cells they also need there is a myoglobin within the uh, card uh, the skeletal muscles or voluntary muscles and they need oxygen if the oxygen supply or is uh, is less in the tissues of course is results in easy, easy fatigability shortness of breath or dyspnea this again oxygenation is less in the lungs so this result in shortness of breath light headedness fainting cognitive abnormalities they uh, something to do with the cns uh, because less oxygen supply to the uh, neurons of the CNS or the brain. Uh, cognitive ability means that thinking is impaired, the memory is impaired. Uh, the ischemic pain that is less oxygen is going to the cardiac muscle now resulting in cardiac pain or chest pain called angina. Then cardiovascular manifestations, tachycardia, palpitation you feel your heartbeat and in severe cases congestive heart failure you see this is our compensatory mechanism if there is less uh, um, uh, oxygen supply to the tissues uh, because of less hemoglobin so they start the heart starts pumping uh, more vigorously and uh, the, the heart rate is increasing as a compensatory mechanism now symptoms of acute hemorrhage that's how quickly you lose the blood uh, in in uh, acute conditions called hypovolemia this may result in in shock uh, because of the low blood pressure sometimes fainting or syncope if the blood loss is gradual this over the period of uh, months to years will lead to iron deficiency anemia the underlying mechanism leukemia for example this may result in bone pains uh, organomegaly for example bleeding uh, uh, the uh, gums uh, pallor and so on. Thalassemia will result in typical thalassemic fishes, enlargement of spleen and liver, stunted growth, aplastic anemia, there will be no organomegaly, simply sphere pallor and because of thrombocytopenia there will be bleeding tendency. Fever may be there because of the underlying infection. Organomegaly in leukemias, lymphomas, in thalassemia for example. Purpura and bruises because of the low platelet count in the skin. Jaundice, very typical sign of hemolytic anemias. In fact, unconjugated bilirubin is increased, resulting in increased um, bilirubin, that is jaundice. Now, just uh, uh, um, to summarize the morphology, like for example, if you see, uh, this is the normocytic normochromic which is seen commonly, of course, in the normal individuals and also when there is normocytic normochromic anemia with, with low hemoglobin. Uh, then the very important one is the iron deficiency. You can see hypochromic cells and very small cells. Then you have the megaloblastic anemia with macrocytosis and hypersegmentation of neutrophils. Then you have uh, the inherited ones, the thalassemia, hypochromic cells, target cells, sometimes basophilic stippling. Spherocytosis, you have the small spheroidal cells. Sickle cell, the uh, sickle cell anemia, you have the sickle-like cells. Uh, then, for example, the important one, elliptocytosis and so on. Now, the last portion, how would you diagnose anemia in the laboratory? There is a long list of the uh, number of tests or the uh, types of tests. It is beyond the scope of this lecture to go for the detailed interpretation of the test results. But I may sh tell you uh, to some extent, but the most important uh, the investigation is the complete blood counts or CBC, which uh, in fact includes hemoglobin, the total white cell count, the differential count, for example, how many neutrophils, how many lymphocytes or uh, isthmophils or basophils, the RBC count and the platelet count. 
Then the red cells indices, the mean corpuscular volume, uh, me, uh, the mean hemoglobin uh, detected by MCH or MCHC. Uh, now the hematocrit we have already mentioned, the volume of RBC is per liter volume of blood. This will be definitely of course decreased in anemias. RBC morphology because or the peripheral blood film examination because we have to classify the anemia whether it is normocytic, normochromic or it is mycocytic, hyperchromic or macrocytic and any variation in size and shape or any RBC inclusion and so on. What is reticulocyte count? I've already mentioned these are the young RBCs and they are normally present within the peripheral blood for one to two days. Uh, then they reach to maturity and they are become mature RBCs. The only difference is that they are larger in size and then they become fully mature, they become normal in size. The normal size is roughly the size of a small lymphocyte. The normal value in adult is between 0.2 to 2% they are, and in the newborn 4% or more. Now this is very important especially in conditions where there is excessive hemolysis. They, they will be increased in the reticulocyte count because immature RBCs will be showered into the peripheral blood. I, they may be decreased in case of bone marrow failure like in aplastic anemia or in myelodysplastic syndromes or in megaloblastic anemia. Then serum iron and total iron binding capacity and serum ferritin. Of course, definitely they will be decreased in iron deficiency anemia, but in certain situations they are increased. Like for example, anemia of chronic infections or in hemolytic anemias. What is total iron binding capacity? Now, the capacity of the hemoglobin to bind iron is only 16% or one third of total capacity. When iron is not available, this binding capacity is increased because there is less iron to be bound to the uh, hemoglobin. So uh, we say total iron binding capacity is increased in case of iron deficiency name. Now serum ferritin is a good indicator of iron stores. Then in megaloblastic anemia, uh, we can do B12 and folic acid level. Combs test actually determines the presence of uh, antibodies against the RBCs in case of autoimmune hemolytic anemias or in case of allomune hemolytic anemia. Serum haptoglobins, they are actually uh, the proteins synthesized in the liver and they are used. Now, you know what happens in intravascular hemolysis, the hemoglo free hemoglobin uh, is released within the blood. So these haptoglobins bind this hemoglobin and take back in the liver where it is metabolized. So definitely haptoglobins will be decreased in intravascular hemolysis. When there is free hemoglobin, it may be secreted in the urine called hemoglobin urea. Now to detect abnormal hemoglobin, for example, fetoglobin F in thalassemias, hemoglobin S, in case of sickle cell anemia, the, is, is a test called hemoglobin electrophoresis. Another way of doing it is high performance liquid chromatography to detect abnormal hemoglobin. This will be taught to you in detail when we discuss hemoglobin, uh, hemoglobinopathies in the higher classes. Bone marrow examination is sometimes very important, for example, to rule out aplastic anemia. In case of leukemias and lymphomas, in case of multiple myeloma, we have increased in plasma cells. Sometimes you have to do cell markers or immunophenotyping because, you know, the sometimes the abnormal cells, like for example, the leukemic cells, the lymphoma cells, the certain abnormal cell markers appear over these abnormal cells and this we can detect through a um, uh, process known as immunophenotyping. Sometimes you have to do DNA testing or chromosome uh, abnormalities testing. Uh, that may be used in leukemias or in certain inherited conditions like thalassemia um, and so on. Now, finally, a summary or quiz. Now, since we are not uh, here face to face, so the definition of anemia, as I've already mentioned, that it is decrease in hemoglobin, RBC count and hematocrit and you should know uh, uh, the normal range of hemoglobin, RBC count and hematocrit according to the age and according to the gender. Then you should know, you should be able to classify anemia based on morphology of the RBCs and based on the uh, hypochromia of the uh, or uh, uh, normochromia of the red cells 
and then based on the underlying mechanisms. Uh, then pathophysiology, how the pathology will lead to symptomatology of anemia. Like for example, tissue epoxy uh, leading to uh, dyspnea or shortness of breath or then CNS uh, hypoxia will lead to like fainting, uh, cognitive abnormalities and so on. Then how to diagnose anemia in the laboratory. Now this I uh, told you this long list of tests, the most important being uh, the blood counts, the hemoglobin, the RBC count, the platelet count, the white cell count and the differential count. Then RBC morphology is very important, then serum RN, TIBC level, B12 folic acid level, bone marrow examination, hemoglobin electrophysics, they are all very important tests. Now this finishes with the uh, lecture, very important announcement that we will, since we are not conducting tutorials, so we will be conducting, uh, we will be um, as, as a, an attachment sending certain questions to you as an assignment and uh, they should be questions should, uh, uh, the answers should be brief and to the point, uh, you will type them and scan them. Uh, and then uh, you will upload on the uh, emails uh, we will send to you. So uh, two teachers will uh, check your assignment, one Dr. Um, uh, Nadeem Nusrat and then I myself, Professor Vaseem Iqbal. And uh, we'll send you the email and we'll divide the whole class in two groups. So uh, thank you very much for patient listening. I hope this will be beneficial for you. And we will also upload on um, um, the uh, actually uh, the actual lecture uh, as a PowerPoint presentation. Thank you very much.